This program brought to you by eChoice, helping thousands of Australians find the right home loan since 1998. And welcome to Money Talks. On the show tonight, we meet the CEO of the multi-billion dollar fund business, Russell Pillamar of Pingana. Julia Lee gives us her hot stock for in the energy sector. And we find out if it's time to invest in the beaten up Chinese tech stocks. But first, an inquest into the Dreamworld tragedy has heard that the theme park safety guidelines warned of the potentials for rafts to flip on the Thunder River Rapids ride. Four people died on the Gold Coast ride in October 2016. The inquest will continue for a further two weeks. Arden Leisure is the company that runs Dreams a Dream World and its chairman Gary Weiss took the reins after the tragedy and is in the process of revamping the company structure. I spoke to him on Friday. You are now chair of Arden Leisure. Um, and as a company that's had a few challenges in recent times, particularly since the, the dream world tragedy. What's happening to the company? Um, the process of remediation of the two remaining businesses uh, is well underway, Peter. Um, there has been a significant transformation of Ardent over the last 12 months. Uh, most significantly, a, a uh, considerable strengthening of the balance sheet. Uh, we sold the bowling and entertainment division in Australia mm. and as a consequence of that net debt has reduced uh, very substantially from 233 million dollars at uh, balance state at the end of FY17 mm. to just over 11 million dollars at uh, balance state for FY18. Mm. Uh, we have recruited a new uh, uh, chief executive for our US operations and well advanced in uh, the appointment of a new chief executive for our theme park division here in Australia. When Arden was flying high, and, and they've had some good moments in their share price history, the, the jewel in the crown was seen to be the American expansion. Is that still the case? Yes, I think uh, we have a lot of opportunity in, in the United States and under the leadership of uh, Chris Morris, we're already seeing uh, some of the latent potential of that business uh, coming forward. Mm -hmm. Um, the company uh, in the, the operations in the US uh, did falter for uh, a period of time. They had negative like-for-like -like sales growth for nearly two years. Uh, we have now arrested uh, that decline uh, and there is nothing that I've seen which would suggest that um, there aren't some very good times ahead mm. for our US operation. My last question is when you started accumulating an interest in the, the company, did you think you'd end up being chair one day? That was never part of the original plan, mm -hmm. Peter. Um, our modus operandi is to buy into companies as, and bring a proprietorial uh, involvement and focus to, uh, to the companies we invest in. Mm -hmm. And usually that does involve board representation, which is something that uh, we sought uh, after we uh, acquired a substantial shareholding. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you are well aware, that was rebuffed uh, and there then followed a, a highly uh, publicised proxy campaign which did result in uh, me being appointed to the board and then there was certainly the, the mood amongst the directors at the time that, that should then, uh, it should then follow that I become chairman. Yeah, that's Gary Weiss, and uh, next week I talk to him about a pretty exciting feel-good fund which involves some of the best fund managers in the country. That's for next week, Gary Weiss from Arden Leisure. And joining me now is Russell Pilmer. He's the CEO of Pengano, which is a local funds management business that I think has a really exciting and interesting fund coming to market. Russell, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So, so look, the history of Pengano, as I, said, I pointed out earlier, a multi-billion dollar fund, it's a, it's a local Local um, development, isn't it? Just tell us about the company. So, Pengan has been going now since 2003. We operate several different strategies across international equities and Australian equities. Mm -hmm. I think what, what makes us different to the rest of the market is we've got a very strong focus on good, solid, long term growth for our investors with um, capital preservation. So we're worried about volatility. We are lower risk type manager. Mm. But if you can generate good solid returns year in, year out, we all know with the magical power of comp 
compounding mm. that you'll generate excellent return over the long term, which is what all our funds have done. And this could be a hard question. Pingana? What's the name? Uh, Pingana is actually an Aboriginal uh, mythological bird yeah. uh, that has a particular claw that allowed it to extract prey um, where other birds You're extracting are value, are you? <laughs> it's extracting value, exactly. Okay. Um, what's the feeling, you know, because obviously you're the CEO, so you're not picking stocks, but you'd have to have a feel from talking to your pointy-headed you know, champions, fund managers in the organisation. What's their feeling about the outlook for stocks? Because a lot of my viewers keep hearing conflicting views. I, I, I remain positive on stocks, but I know there are a lot of challenges out there. What are, you, what yeah. are your guys saying? So, so when it comes to markets, um, uh, I have a very definite answer where markets are going, mm. and that is that we have absolutely no idea. <laughs> so across the Pengana business, yeah. we don't try and predict markets because they're far too hard to predict. Yeah. And we know the world uh, is somewhat in turmoil at the moment, mm. uh, but we're not sure whether things are going to be fantastic or whether things are, are dire. Mm. And I think that's yet to be determined. Mm. And uh, um, so I think the best thing that you can do is balance out your portfolio, be um, careful about how you're investing. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'd say is that go for an active manager, go for somebody who does have the potential to manage the downside, mm -hmm. because it's very possible that that downside might be around the corner. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be left naked to the market, for instance, if you're in one of those um, index style funds mm -hmm. that has no downside protection. Okay, now what I was really interested in was this private equity fund that you're bringing to market. So tell, explain to my viewers what a private equity fund would actually do. So um, our fund invests into uh, private companies and we do this alongside uh, private equity fund managers. Mm. So uh, there are a lot of great private equity fund managers uh, in the world who've managed to generate lots of great returns yep. over many uh, long, long term periods. Uh, we invest into their funds which invest into these various companies and the very interesting thing about the private equity uh, about private companies is that 98% um, of companies in the US and Europe with revenues in excess of $10 million are actually private. Mm -hmm. So if you only invest into listed companies, you're actually um, ignoring 98% mm -hmm. um, of the market. Mm -hmm. So th with, with our private equity uh, fund managers, we're able to invest into these companies. And historically, these private equity fund managers as a, uh, as, as a sector have outperformed listed equity mm -hmm. markets. Yeah, so most people are used to a private equity fund seeing a business like Dick Smith coming along, buying it, revamping it, putting it in the market, making a lot of money and going away. Now, private equity companies do look around for value where they can add capital or some kind of insight that the company hasn't got and they make a lot of money out of doing that sort of thing. So when you, these people contribute to your fund, will they be in a sense investing alongside those private equity funds? Um, absolutely. They will be investing into um, a, a probably 30 or 40 different private equity yeah, funds. There's one bet. Yes, so yes around bets. the world. In fact, if you look through our portfolio, there'll be about 500 underlying exposures, mm. underlying companies that you will have be, been invested in. Mm. And you'll do this together with private equity fund managers or through the private equity fund managers. And, and you'll be doing it with a, a pretty famous US private equity uh, manager, right? right? Yes, yeah, so Grosvenor Capital is one of the largest players in the world. Mm. They've been doing private equity investing for over two decades now, mm. and they've got this fantastic uh, track record, and we'll be leveraging off their capabilities. And, and what will be the, the minimum amount someone would be able to put into the fund? Oh, look, the, the amounts will be small. It will be a listed vehicle, mm. which is uh, the distinguishing factor about our fund. Yeah. So there's other ways of investing in private equity, but the only way that investors will be able to invest in a large portfolio of global private equity yeah. um, investments in listed vehicle will be through Pangana. Okay, and we'll, we're talking about what, a thousand or ten thousand? Oh, well, in the IPO, there's probably going to be something like a ten or twenty thousand dollar minimum. Yeah. Um, however, afterwards, when it's listed, it's listed, you can go and buy one share if you like. Yeah, and, and so it, it will have a unit price like a share price. And a absolutely. And it'll be bought, bought on the ASX and, and so on and so forth. Absolutely. So it's quite fascinating. This used to be the realm of mega rich families family yeah, offices, exactly. sophisticated institutions who would be able to access these types of opportunities. Mm. We're actually taking this directly to retail investors now, mm. and this is this is really a Okay, first. what's it going to be called and when will it be available? So it will be called the Pengana Global Private Equity uh, Fund, yeah. and it will be available uh, in uh, early in the new year. So in February, we'll probably be going out to market. Okay. Well, um, I think it's a really innovative and interesting idea, and it's a, a 
an opportunity for people to diversify in an area where they generally can't get a slice of the action. Thank you. With my pleasure. That's Russell Pilliner, who's the CEO of Pingana. Now stick around because coming up after the break is Bell Direct's Julia Lee with her hot stock of the week. Welcome back. Each week we set Julia Lee of Bell Direct a task to find her favourite stock within a specific industry. And this week she's put the spotlight on an energy business. But before we start, Julia, today the market was down pretty substantially. What were the main drivers of that? It was a really big fall, Pete. I mean, in the top 20 stocks, not one of them managed to gain. So you know on a day like that, it's mm. a pretty serious fall. So that's why my fund was down four cents today. <laughs> Being a dividend growth fund, we have a lot of those top 20s in there. Okay, right. I, Nothing was sheltered from yeah. today's fall. Yeah. Um, look, part of it was the US stock performance on Friday, but yeah. we saw some mild falls on the US on continued US bond yields rising. Yeah. But I think the big thing was China. Look, we heard that China had cut rates for the fourth time this year, yeah. but the Chinese stock market came back from a week-long holiday and we saw the market down by 3%. So that okay. had an impact on the Aussie currency as well as our market. Yeah, OK. And, and there's also some interesting news about... about um Invocare as well. <laughs> <laughs> you got to throw this my viewers. People believe that you can't get away from death and taxes, but well. yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a good news story for Australians yeah. because m more of us are living this year compared to last year. Um, so because the flu is just not as bad. Yes, no, that's right. The Invocare is a funeral business, mm. and the flu vaccine has been so effective this year, as well as a mild winter, yeah. that the rate of death has, has been quite low in the June to August period, and probably be even worse in the September period. So volumes are down at Invocare. Mm. And that makes me think, that, you know, what are the implications of some of the other stocks listed yeah. on the ASX? Yeah. If the, there's less people getting the flu this year, that's me, that means less visits to GPs. Mm. So medical centre businesses would be impacted. And also less people getting the flu swab, so pathology. So some of the companies that might also mm. be impacted uh, include not only Invocare, but primary healthcare and maybe even Sonic. Okay, let's go to the energy area now. Uh, what's the outlook for the sector? Well, it's been fantastic. Uh, oil prices are up 50% in the past year, and we, we call this one of the typical areas that do well late cycle. Yeah. And that's because this is a cyclical area which is dependent on global growth. Global growth which is, is good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Global growth is still travelling at the highest level that we've seen in seven years since 2011. So mm. energy is doing well as a sector, and some of the performances in this space, I mm. mean, Beach Petroleum, I think, is up 150%. I think that was one of my stock tips with you. Yeah, Maybe around yeah, about yeah exactly right. Well, and what about Santos? How's it going? Santos is doing well as well. I guess when you're looking at stocks, I always look for new information and new positive information. Mm. And Santos came out to say that it's increasing production. So they're looking at producing more than 100 barrels of oil equivalent by 2025. And that means in the next uh, seven years, at some stages, Santos is going to be producing probably more than Woodside Petroleum. Gee, that's quite, quite staggering. Caltex, people associate with uh, petrol, it then became, in some people's eyes, a, a, a shopping, um, like a retail business. What is it? You're absolutely right. When you look at the oil and gas space, Caltex is a bit of a strange one. It sits in that oil and gas space, but it doesn't follow all the others. And yeah. that's because of the marketing business, which makes it a retail business. They have this deal with Woolies where they are trying to uh, roll out um, some other ventures. So the food area and the metro, mm. they're rolling out at the moment. And I guess if you look at Caltex, it is the leading convenience retailer in Australia. It's staggering, isn't it? Now, your favourite stock has a really interesting um, ticker code, Sexy, SXY. <laughs> That's one Did way to remember. Did you pick it on purpose? <laughs> I didn't even notice it till <laughs> now. <laughs> SXY is Senex Energy. Yes, yeah, Senex Energy. When we've seen oil prices rallying as hard as they have, you have to get a little bit more riskier mm. and, I guess, sexier to make money yeah. from these type of assets. Yep. And so looking at this, this is one that has done a lot of explorations, a lot of savvy deals in the past mm. and it's about to cash in on some of those deals. The Queensland government um, was awarding 13 different tenements and Synex Energy won the first of those tenements. Mm. Um, and those tenements that it won earlier this year um, 
are surrounded by shells tenements. So mm. when you're examining new potential assets, it always pays to have a look at the area surrounding and who's involved and mm. what the success has been. Yeah. So a massive giant like shell, it means those um, atlas fields are quite um, attractive mm. and they're fast tracking that they've yeah. got the funding in place. Do we, do we look at what the government's trying to do? Because even the Prime Minister's saying, I, I want to keep electricity prices down. What does that do to your analysis of what energy prices can do or is it going to be independent if world energy prices go up these guys will be beneficiaries well Cenex energy is in a strange place the reason why it was awarded one of those 13 tenements by the queensland government which was a fantastic deal for Cenex energy mm. is because the, the governments are trying to fast track um, gas supply into the domestic market yep. so this gas supply is not for export it's for the domestic market okay. and to try and relieve i guess some of the stress that's coming from a lot of our mm. products going offshore okay so this is your your hot we'll call it the sexy stock of the week it, it's pre-growth so the growth is yet to come yeah. it's hit some major milestones which yeah. are, are quite exciting yeah. um, look it's got a joint venture which it's also doing with beach patrolling which has been a huge success story yeah. and in this area it's such a strange area when you look at oil and gas because yeah. your assets are deteriorating assets you have to replace them if you just sat on your assets and kept on producing, you'd be left with nothing left to hold. So often it's about the up and coming projects and the portfolio yeah. assets, yeah. not just the producers. Exactly, Julia. Thanks very much. Thanks. That's Julia Lee, and it's now time for our Wealth 101 segment. Last week I showed this confusing chart, and a viewer made a really important point. Let's just see that chart so you can see. It's, it's really confusing, but it's the blue line I want people to concentrate on. And this just shows that $10,000 invested in 1970, round up up being $453,000 but the viewer pointed out that someone could have nearly bought a house for $10,000 in those days well it wouldn't have been in Paddington or, or Turak $10,000 but you're probably right in the, in the outer suburbs of probably Sydney and Melbourne you could have so to make the lesson more appropriate for today if someone had invested $1,000 say in an ETF like IOZ or STM uh, 40, in 40 years time that would grow into about $45,000 sure there is inflation but the lessons are very clear first the magic of compound interest can make you wealthy second the earlier you get your money into quality diversified investments and let that roll over and roll over the, the greater the chances are you'll end up being very comfortable and having a great material life and third make sure you expose yourself to quality programs like this one that only has one goal and that's to make you richer coming up after break we will work out if it's time to invest in the beaten up chinese tech stocks with our fundy for the week kevin bertoli from pm capital Welcome back. Kevin Bertoli is the Portfolio Manager for Asian Equities at PM Capital. He's here to give us his take on whether it's time to load up on Chinese tech stocks. They've copped it since the Trump trade war commenced. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. Good to be here. Yeah, mate, I, I, this is something I wanted to know the answer to, and that's why I wanted you to come on the show. So um, a lot of Chinese tech stocks, and particularly really well-known ones like Tencent, have down, what, 20%, 30% since the Trump trade war uh, rhetoric started. Well, and, and so people keep asking, is it time to get in? What do you feel? Yeah, it's interesting. So if you look at the, the big names that most people know, you've got Tencent, they'd be down 35%. Alibaba, Baidu, they're both down around 25%. And you've got yeah. JD.com, which is Alibaba's... All great number, companies. All great companies, they're down 55%. Gee. So big moves. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because if we had a f gone back six months ago and walked into a room of investors, everybody yep. in that room would have told you that they were long Tencent, yep. uh, which to us, we're, we're in the, on the lookout for market anomalies. So uh, that's not what we want to hear. Mm. Uh, what we've seen predominantly so far in this market has been a lot of ETF selling. So people selling the broad basket of Asian stocks, which yep. includes those big cap names, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu. Mm. Uh, so that's really a macro issue mm. as opposed to structural line changes in the business so yeah. of that uh, that that market component we like Baidu mm. we've owned that for a long time we continue to do yeah, that was that down did you say that 35 that was down about that's down about 25 yeah, percent okay, yeah. um, so we like that business uh, 10 cents down a little bit uh, more than that and 
We don't own Tencent and one of the areas that we're concerned a little bit with Tencent is around regulatory. Yeah. People have started to talk about the regulatory side for their games business. Uh, I'd be more concerned about the regulatory issues around uh, their social media business. Okay, so as a group, it's, it's not time. You like the idea as a standout. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, we're wearing the we're on the lookout for market anomalies, and, yeah. and my view would be that most people still have a positive view on ten cent longer term. Yeah. We would like that to turn mm. people to become more bearish about the business opportunity over going. a five ten year. Okay. Yeah. Now, what about uh, Macau and gaming? You think this has got a, 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 a part of the story that you want to? talk about. Sorry. Yeah, this is one of the areas that we've been invested in over the last decade, yeah. uh, on and off. Uh, and that's something that's been at the epicentre of the China trade war concerns. Yeah. Obviously, 60, 70 percent of the visitors. And your chart, the blue is, uh, and the red is? Yeah, so on that chart, we've basically got three of the Aussie gaming stocks and we've got three of the Macau gaming stocks. The yeah. blue chart's the PE for uh, those holdings yeah. and the red is the, the dividend yield. Okay. So what we're trying to highlight in this chart here is Macau, mm. long-term structural growth story that we like. Short-term, yeah. people are concerned given their uh, correlation and reliance on Chinese mainland gamblers. Yeah. But if you actually look at the valuation, they're now trading at much cheaper multiples than the Aussie gaming businesses. Mm. So you can buy Win Macau, MGM China, they're trading at 13 to 14 times. Mm. You're getting a 5 to 6% dividend for both of those names. Okay, right. So, and, and also you've got another chart which focuses on rates, and this is an important part of your uh, analysis as well. Yeah, rates is an interesting one because it comes more back to the fundamental commentary around uh, emerging markets and the right time to be looking at yeah. emerging markets. So if you actually look at what's happened globally over the last 30 years, you've had a consistent downward trend in interest rates. Mm. Uh, that downward trend in interest rates has been a positive tailwind for valuation yeah. uh, and for emerging markets. Mm. Uh, that's starting to reverse, so that actually starts to become a headwind. So when you think about rising rates, a rising US dollar, Mm. Uh, and um, rising commodity prices. Those three things combined start to put a lot of pressure on emerging market mm. economies. Yeah. So you think about, you know, Brazil is a good example. Uh, the oil price is up 45% in the last year. Their currency is down 25%. 15% of their imports are oil products. Mm. So to buy the same amount of oil products this year that they bought last year, it's about 80% more expensive. Mm. That filters through to businesses. They pass that price increase onto consumers yep. and it starts to have an impact on the economy. So are you basically saying at this point in time with the, the kind of uh, interest rates and currency movements, emerging economies, you'd be very careful about them? Yes, and if you, you look at the way we invest, mm. we invest very different. We don't take a broad top-down mm. view of investing. Our portfolios are 20 to 25 ideas. So you pick companies? We pick companies. So all of our research is done at the sector or individual business level yeah. and we build our research from the bottom up. Mm. We're agnostic to geography, yeah. sector. And so if someone has no exposure to foreign stocks at this point mm -hmm. in time, you, you, I guess you're saying as a, as a general rule you wouldn't encourage them to go long into emerging economies at this point in time? I'd, I'd, what I would say is that if you look at emerging markets over the next five to ten years, yeah. I think people want to be thinking about how they get exposure to mm. those markets. Mm. Because if you look at the global GDP landscape, mm. Asia is 40% of global GDP and yep. it's only growing. Yeah. So people want to be exposed there. Good medium term, but, but short need... term it could be a little bit of a, a yes. bumpy ride. But you want to take an opportunity like this in terms of it being a bit of a bumpy ride yeah. to actually get invested in those markets. All right, mate. Thanks for joining us. Okay. That's Kevin Bertoli from PM Capital. Very interesting insights. Now, that's the show. Join us next week for an exclusive interview with Gary Weiss, as I pointed out, about Arden Leisure and an exciting new feel-good fund. And if you want to get my wealth building insights each day, just go to Switzer Daily or www.switzer.com.au. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. This program brought to you by eChoice, helping thousands of Australians find the right home loan since 1998.